Welcome to Patient Handoffs 101, Critical to Patient Safety. I'm Vinnie Aurora. I'm one of the Associate Directors of the Internal Medicine Residency, as well as an Assistant Dean at the Pritzker School of Medicine. To, the objectives of today's talk are to discuss the importance of handoffs, as well as this impact on patient safety, to understand the science of handoff communication, as well as to review techniques for safe and effective handoffs for senders and receivers. Now, the components of a handoff for the purposes of today's talk are verbal communication, which could take place in person or over the phone, written communication, usually that's in the form of a sign out, as well as the transfer of professional responsibility. Now, it's important to remember that handoffs are a two-way street. It's not just about the sender sending information, but handoffs are best understood as a dialogue an interaction that fosters common ground, empathy, and equity to transfer necessary information. So while the senders must paint a picture, it's the receiver that must see it, understand it, act on it, and ultimately communicate it to someone else. Now, unfortunately, handoffs can go wrong. And as you saw in the video, there are several steps to the handoff. Uh, the pre-handoff period where the sender organizes and updates handoff information. The arrival, where you stop patient care tasks to conduct the handoff. The dialogue, which is the specific verbal exchange between the sender or the receiver. And then the post-handoff period, where the receiver is assuming new information and integrating it into the care of the patient. Now in the video, the pre-handoff period could be plagued by lack of time, poor time management or fatigue, or lack of clinical judgment to construct a proper handoff. The arrival could be um, hampered by no set location or time, not being able to contact the sender or receiver, or in this case, competing um, work or personal obligations. The dialogue could be affected because maybe the sender used vague language um, and um, was unclear or failed to provide a clinical impression of what was going on and what to do about it. And the receiver could be distracted doing something else, misunderstand or not clarify and ask questions. And then in the post handoff period, the uh, receiver could forget key information, not document what they did, um, act on a plan without taking into account new information, or not be invested in the care of the patient due to a lack of professional responsibility. Now, um, the way in which the video depicts all of the um, elements of a handoff gone wrong is based on a um, study that we have done um, back in 2005 and really aligns closely with this patient safety model of the Swiss cheese model, where in order for an adverse event to occur, um, like resuscitating a patient whose code status was less than that or transferring somebody to the ICU when they did not want to be, it is these layers that all lined up and, um, and the, like the holes in Swiss cheese, um, you we did not have failure safe processes at each of these steps. And this is important because when something bad happens in the hospital or a handoff fails, it's usually not just one reason that actually led to the failure, it's usually um, a chain of many and we need to figure out why. So how can we improve handoff communication? Uh, well, in order to do that, we must understand handoff communication theory. And unfortunately, even in everyday language, sis speakers systematically overestimate how well their messages are understood by listeners. And then there's also something called the egocentric heuristic. Senders assume that the receiver has all the same knowledge they do. And this worsens the better you know somebody. So the people that you're going to most likely miscommunicate with in your lifetime are going to be the people that you know the best, um, like your spouse or significant other or your best friend or your family member. We've actually studied this in pediatric handoffs, which actually have an optimal environment and it's supervised by senior residents and attendings and a dedicated room and time. And um, what we found was that the most important piece of information was not communicated 60% of the time, despite the sender believing it had been. And what's worse is sometimes the sender and the receiver didn't even agree on the rationale, and at times it was completely contradictory. Um, like the receiver thought the most important piece of information was to call the case manager because the patient was going home, when in fact the sender wanted to communicate um, the reason to call the case manager was the patient needed to stay. Now this study did show one important piece of information actually, which is that 
um, if-then items and to-do items were way more likely to be remembered than knowledge items. So there is a danger of too much verbal communication at the time of the handoff, particularly with information overload. So you really want to make your verbal communication high yield. Now, when we study other industries and looked at handoffs, a lot of other human factors researchers have looked at this, and the strategies they recommend are standardizing the handoff by using the same order or template, um, emphasizing updating the information, limiting interruptions, ensuring that you have a face-to-face -face verbal update when possible with interactive questioning, aiming for the dialogue, as well as a structure like read back to ensure accuracy. Now, uh, whenever we ask people if uh, they've done a read back, not very many people raise their hand. It is a requirement for critical lab tests by the Joint Commission, and so you may participate in a read back. However, if you've all gone through a drive through or ordered your favorite takeout food, um, we have a lot of good Thai food in Hyde Park, you will actually participate in a read back because the restaurant industry has a business case for getting your order right. And readbacks have actually been shown to be cost effective and reduce errors in laboratory um, reporting and patient safety. And this study that was done at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, 29 errors were detected during requested readback of 822 lab results, and all errors were detected and corrected. Now, in four cases, the recipient refused to repeat the message. So the reason that's important is because even if you put into a simple um, uh, um, intervention like read back and if your um, frontline staff or the residents or the nurses aren't on board it's really not going to work no matter how simple it is. Now what about technology? We have the EPIC electronic health record here and many people do ask about um, computerized sign out and it has been shown to improve outcomes in specific hospitals. Um, however, IT solutions alone cannot substitute for a successful communication act. So just because the electronic health record is there does not mean that you do not have a need to verbally communicate. And in this dramatic example, in an emergency room, the replacement of a phone call for critical lab values with an electronic results reporting system, so there was no verbal communication, but the staff had to go look up the results, resulted in over um, 1,400 of 3,000 um, urgent lab results to go unchecked in the first few weeks of implementation. So you can imagine how um, how challenging this was uh, for that emergency room, but also how critical it is to think about the process of communicating before you just delegate it to the computer. Now another problem that we see a lot with electronic health records is what we call the Copaga syndrome, which stands for copy and paste gone amok. And uh, this is repeated highlighting, copying and pasting text uh, from uh, current notes into new notes, and this leads to zombie-like pro propagation of inaccuracies that persist, as well as crowding out useless information by gluts of useless data. And um, in one of the hospitals I work at, 74% of residents saw cut and paste problems in their sign out. Now, usually cut and paste is associated with another problem, TMI, or too much information. This is when you over rely on the sign out for your own work and it becomes an unnecessarily long shadow chart, almost like a personal tracker of information. But remember that the receiver can easily get overloaded and your primary function is to help them remember what to do. And so you wanna really make sure that it's clear what portions of the sign out refer to them. So for written sign out, we've developed some best practices and that is to include all patients, even those that are discharged that day since sometimes patients don't go home, making sure you build in the time in your workflow to update your written sign out daily. Now, some of you are gonna be working with sign outs that are actually feeding from the electronic health record and that would be great because then the medical medication changes and other changes are easier to update um, because either they're auto imported or you can refresh them. But if you are using a paper sign out, you need to be very conscious about this. It's also important to update your to-do items with specific rationale and instruction. Remember, the electronic health record cannot do this. And if you wrote check MRI um, and uh, today and it's no longer today, you don't want to risk that your patient gets another MRI because the um, night float intern thinks that an MRI needed to be reordered. Um, you also want to include information that may become important in a critical situation like code status, IV access, family and contact information.
So um, we've developed a rubric to help you think about how to um, create good written signouts. The first is, is the signout updated, um, updated daily progress. Um, it should really include today's events. The problem list should be prioritized in order of importance. So if a patient develops stroke in the hospital, that should not be problem number seven. Maybe that's their new problem and it's problem number one. And their chronic problems like hypertension and diabetes can go to, at the bottom and their acute problems can go at the top. Is the diagnosis in the one-liner when a diagnosis has been made? So this is 76-year-old female with multiple medical problems presents with shortness of breath. That may be appropriate on day one, but on day two or day three, unless it's still that fascinating case of shortness of breath, you probably should list the diagnosis because your uh, goal is not to fool your night floats. Um, anticipatory guidance should be clear and specific. So culture of spikes and start antibiotics could be one way of saying that, but that could be very vague. And a better way of saying that is if the patient has continued fever, start vancomycin and even give the dose that you would want them to start at. Um, you want to be careful of too much information, as well as highlighting error-prone medications when you are updating the sign-out uh, by hand. And the uh, medications that are most likely to be out of date include anticoagulants, antibiotics, narcotics, and insulin. Um, and that's usually because these are changing all the time in the hospital. Lastly, you want your directions to be clear with rationale. So we often say check CBC, check BMP, uh, basic metabolic profile. That is a lot of labs to check and it doesn't give any guidance on what to do. So you really want to focus on what is it that you're really trying to check. So check hemoglobin and if below seven, transfuse two units. So strategies for verbal communication include face-to-face -face communication is best. Oftentimes that can be achieved, but if it can't be at least dialogue over the phone. Prioritize your time on those most sick. And so as opposed to starting with the patient that's been there the longest and might be the most stable, you might wanna start with the patient that was newly admitted um, or is the sickest patient. Aim to make it interactive um, and try to overcome the egocentric heuristic by thinking about what the other person needs to know by focusing specifically on upcoming issues like the if-then statements, what may happen overnight and what to do about it, as well as tasks that need to be done. Now, you may be exposed to a lot of handoff mnemonics, um, and this is actually the most commonly used mnemonic, SBAR, Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. It originated in the Navy and it was adapted for nurse to physician communication. And now it's being used in handoffs, particularly in nursing here at University of Chicago Medicine. Um, this is not a mnemonic that, um, that many of our residents use, however, but we did want to share that this is something that you may be exposed to because of uh, the nursing initiative. Um, while there are many mnemonics, um, the thing that's most important to remember about mnemonics is they do help with standardization um, and, um, and improving the quality of information, but it's still very important to think about just because you're using a mnemonic doesn't necessarily mean your handoff is adequate. So what can senders do? Well, certainly think about the receiver, focus on the relevant items that will be remembered, like the sickest patients, the daily progress, and then the directions, like the to-do items and if-then items. Include directions with rationale and avoid ambiguity, particularly like the check CVC example. And check for receiver understanding. You can encourage questions and read back. What can receivers do? Well, they can actively listen, stay focused, limit interruptions. Taking notes can even enhance your memory. Ask questions to make sure you're on the same page. Use a system to keep track of to-do items. This is especially helpful if you are a night float intern and you are receiving multiple sign-outs that you need to keep track of, as well as conduct readback to ensure you're on the same page. Now, a readback would be paralyzing if you read back the entire sign-out, and so this is why we um, emphasize reading back to-do items in particular um, and, not, and not the entire um, action of the sign-out. So um, the take-home points are that the tr um, handoff is a transfer of content and professional responsibility, and effective communication strategies include face-to-face -face communication with an opportunity to ask questions, using precise language and explaining rationale, as well as readback. And critical verbal content should really focus on anticipatory guidance, like if-then statements and to-do items, and this should be supplemented with a comprehensive, updated written sign-out. So at this time, I'd like to thank um, several members of the University of Chicago handoff team, as well as our collaborators um, around the country and the world. And, um